Um, I I realize that a lot of our economic system, you know, has a lot of flaws. That uh, a lot of problem problems with it. You know, like wage labor that's not particularly pleasant. That you know, the rich have the big gap between like rich and poor. But I mean, it's together now because there's been like increasing standards of living in America and isn't, isn't that in one way like a justification for it, the why it's still around, why capitalism, from my understanding, has triumphed and it's still strong. No, it's not. I don't think so. I mean, there was rising standards of living in slave societies. Slaves were much better off in the early 19th century than in the early 18th century. Is that an argument for slavery? <laughs> well, I'm... Oh, it's a terrible argument, you know. I mean, you, and any system, in fact, you could give that argument for Stalinism. Uh, there was very substantial economic growth in the Soviet Union. It's the second world, not the third. It was until 1989. It was the second world, not the third world. Now it's back in the third world because it's undergoing capitalist reforms, something you're not allowed to say, incidentally. You, but if you read, you'll notice. They've had 10 years of capitalist reforms, which have driven them right back into the third world where they came from. Okay, but if you just look at it in terms of economic growth, it was reasonably successful. That's exactly what bothered Western leaders. Uh, if you read uh, the documentary record, right up to the 1960s, where it sort of runs dry at the moment, you find that the great concern was that the, second, the Soviet Union was presenting itself as a model for modernization within a single generation. Uh, and that was uh, raising all sorts of trouble, not only in the third world, but even in the rich countries. Uh, they didn't care about Russian aggression. What they cared about or you know, Stalin's terror or anything. I mean, it didn't bother anybody. In fact, Truman admired Stalin, you know, thought he's an honest man, you know, to deal with him and so on. He said he didn't care what happens in Russia, you know, and so on. But uh, the, uh, uh, the same with Churchill, incidentally, who was defending Stalin in cabinet meetings as a great man and so on and so forth. Uh, they kill as many people as they want. That's irrelevant. The problem was then they never expected them to be attacking anybody, you know. Uh, but they, uh, what they were afraid of was the economic growth, which was, uh, especially in the third world, uh, considered quite impressive. Actually, the same is true of Cuba. Uh, the documents have just been released, uh, and they're interesting, on uh, Kennedy and the Kennedy administration in Cuba. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to see the way the facts are being hidden. Uh, so, for example, uh, just to illustrate, uh, the, when, you know, this thing is going on at the World Trade Organization, the European Union has brought charges against the United States for violating the World Trade Organization agreement uh, with the Helms-Burton Act and the Cuban embargo altogether. And the United States is isolated on that. I mean, in international arena, the only votes for the United States are Israel, which is reflexive. That's like saying the Ukraine voted with Russia in the, in the old days. Uh, so Israel and uh, Uzbekistan, for some reason, I don't know why. Uh, Uzbekistan and Israel are the only countries that voted with the United States on this whole European Union's against it. Uh, what was interesting is that when the United, the United States has simply withdrawn from the World Trade Organization jurisdiction, says you have no right to deal with us because we're the boss of the world. Uh, but uh, uh, the reasons were interesting. Uh, the reasons were that uh, this is a policy that goes back, uh, they said falsely, to the Kennedy administration. We've had three decades of uh, a, a policy of overthrowing the government of Cuba, uh, and the European Union has no right to challenge our policies. That was Stuart Eisenstadt, the government spokesman. Well, there was no reaction to that. It's kind of interesting in itself. It's taken for granted that we have a right to overthrow another government if we feel like it, and if anyone challenges that, they're off base. Uh, but there was an interesting response on narrower grounds uh, by Arthur Schlesinger uh, in the New York Times. He had a letter, and he said to, he said, I want to remind his friend Stuart Eisenhatstadt that he misunderstood the Kennedy administration policies. Uh, the policies, he said, were based on, I'm quoting, Castro's troublemaking in the hemisphere and the Soviet connection. But now that's passed, so it's an anachronism. Well, as Schlesinger was, here comes the discipline of the educated classes, for example, the people in Fletcher School and so on, who certainly know what I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, the, uh, 
documents that came out not long ago from the early 60s uh, bear directly on this question. Arthur Schlesinger uh, was the head of the uh, Latin American mission of the Kennedy, of the incoming Kennedy administration, which was laying out, you know, talking about the problems and the plans for Cuba. And uh, there he explains what troublemaking in the hemisphere means and what the Soviet connection means. He said, uh, the problem with Castro, he said, is the, I'm quoting, the spread of the Castro idea of taking matters into your own hands, okay, which he said has great appeal to people in Latin America, most of whom live in terrific poverty and oppression and are trying to find a more decent life. And with the model of uh, Cuba in front of them, they're likely to do all sorts of things. So that's Castro's troublemaking in the hemisphere. Uh, what's the Soviet connection? Well, the Soviet connection, he said, is that in the background, the Soviet Union is presenting itself as a model for modernization in a single generation. Okay, that's the Soviet connection. Uh, well, yeah, so therefore we have to overthrow the government because of that kind of troublemaking and that kind of connection. And in fact, that extends much more broadly, you know, uh, Kennedy and Macmillan, uh, in their discussions in the early 60s, were worried about the, you know, the potential for economic growth of the Soviet Union and what it would imply. Uh, same was true of Dulles, same goes right back to 1917. So the facts are the opposite of what you're describing. Uh, perhaps my question could be put <laughs> a little differently. If, if this system is so bad and everything, Which why system? hasn't there been, excuse me? Our system? Our system. It's so, it's so bad. Why hasn't, why hasn't there been greater movements to challenge it? Oh, I mean, it's is been challenged all the time. I mean, we have a, for example, we have a very violent labor history. Uh, hundreds of American workers were being killed right into the late 30s. Uh, finally, they got labor rights. Uh, there has been a very extensive challenge through the, through the 50s. Uh, in the 60s, the whole thing blew up. Uh, and in fact, many uh, uh, concessions had to be made. Uh, and it still continues. I mean, we right now happen to be in a period of regression, but as I say, it's cyclic. You know, there was much more regression in the 1920s when labor was really crushed. Uh, so yes, there's always challenge and struggle. Uh, but when you say, is the system so bad, I don't even know what that means. I mean, slave societies went on for centuries and centuries without any challenge. Okay. Uh, did that justify them? And in fact, uh, if you really want to be serious about it, the slave owners were giving arguments rather like yours. So slavery, very much like it. Take, read, say, George Fitzhugh, who was the leading spokesman for the American, you know, South, slave owners in the South, uh, at, at the time when it was becoming a serious issue, like around the 1840s. He had pretty powerful arguments in favor of slavery. Uh, what he was saying is, uh, he was saying is, look, the reason you northerners, northerners are against slavery is because you're anti-Negro racists. Uh, we are not racists. We think that you should take care of your subjects. Uh, so we treat them nicely. Uh, and we even do that on economic grounds because they're our capital. You know, like if I own, make an anachronistic analogy, if, if, if I buy a car and you rent a car, okay, and somebody comes a year later and has a look at the two cars, uh, which car is going to be in better shape? Okay, well, mine, because I own it, so I'm going to take care of it. Not yours, because you rent it, and you can just throw it away and get another one. Okay, that's exactly Fitzhugh's argument. He says, look, we own people, you just rent them. So therefore, we take care of them. We treat them well, we respect them, uh, they're our capital, besides we have human relations with them, we're pre-capitalist, we still have human relations. Uh, you uh, just treat them as tools uh, under wage slavery, and they're much worse off. Uh, so we're the ones who are moral, you're the ones who are immoral. And in fact, under, uh, under the slave system, if you take a look, it was reasonably efficient. Uh, you know, conditions were sort of improving. People lived better, slaves lived better in 1850 than in 1750. Okay, everything you're saying could stand as a perfectly good, not only could be a good argument for slavery, but was offered as an argument for slavery. Similar arguments were given for Bolshevism, or take say fascism. I mean, why was Hitler so popular? You know, Hitler was the most, uh, th through the 30s, Hitler was the most popular leader probably in German history. Well, the reason is he carried out a social revolution. People were living a lot better. I mean, like not everybody, you know, not Jews, for example. Uh, but people were, but Germans were living a lot better. 
it was very successful. Uh, Hitler un either understood or you know figured out, or his advisors did, that uh, large scale scale state expenditures could rescue a, a morbid capital economy from destruction. Pretty much what American business learned during the Second World War, and he was doing it. Uh, and it was uh, the economy was booming, people were better off, and so on. Is that an argument for fascism? No. <laughs>